The world first heard the name Fitbit on the 1st of May 2007. Forbes reports that CEO James Park, who co-founded the company with CTO Eric Friedman, was inspired by the motion sensors in Nintendo Wii games. They conceived the idea to pair accelerometers with smaller and smaller devices. Park and Friedman raised $400,000 but realised that they needed more money to produce their product and take it to market. So using only a circuit board and a wooden box, they were able to demonstrate to investors and raise more capital. With their prototype and a simple website set up, Friedman and Park assumed that they would get 5 to 50 pre-orders respectively. So you can imagine their surprise when they received over 2,000 pre-orders at the TechCrunch 50 conference. Fitbit later opened their headquarters in San Francisco, California. So you might think all it took was a desire to get in shape and a bit of technical know-how to develop their product. But they actually had some troubles in the early stages. Park even said, we probably have a list of seven times that the company was close to death. The company's first tracker was released in December 2009, the Fitbit Classic. It was a clip-on tracker that now seems like a distant relative in the Fitbit product catalog. You could clip the classic onto your person and it would track your motion, but many felt that it had some accuracy issues. And as for the sleep tracking, it needed to be strapped to a wristband, but it did not measure your heart rate, it measured your movement. Unfortunately, some reviewers held that it wasn't a good enough standalone product. Though the classic had some teething problems, it showed the sheer potential of Fitbit and fitness trackers. In 2011, Fitbit faced their first major negative public opinion hurdle. Personal data and sexual activity of users could be found on search engines because the default setting of Fitbit users' profiles was set to public. The company acted quickly and they hid all activity on all records of users, no matter what their settings were. Fitbit even contacted search engines to remove the data. Imagine speaking to Google, Yahoo and Bing saying, please remove those stats from your search engine. So they had the Fitbit Classic and they went on to release similar style trackers in 2011 and 2012. The company went from selling 58,000 units in 2010 to selling 1 million units in 2012. It's 2014 and Fitbit had finally got the message. They were going to release a watch style fitness tracker. Thus the Fitbit Force was born, an activity tracker that could track your statistics in real time. In that year, the company sold over 10 million units. But by late 2014, Apple had released their Apple Watch and shortly after they stopped selling Fitbit devices online and in their physical stores. Yes, believe it or not, Apple used to be a Fitbit retailer. One can only assume that they thought Fitbit was a serious enough competitor. Fitbit released many products, but it wasn't until the release of the Fitbit Charge HR that the company took a significant step to becoming a household name. Fitbit started by focusing heavily on advertising on TV and the internet. They uploaded their first video to YouTube promoting the Fitbit Charge HR and YouTube was instantly flooded with reviews for the watch, making the product a must-have for fitness buffs. In 2015, even the police used Fitbit data to track the activity of a woman who allegedly fabricated a story about being raped. The colossal advertising drive paid off for Fitbit. The company sold 21 million units in that year. It was onwards and upwards for them. Fitbit filed their initial public offering with a New York Stock Exchange listing on the 7th of May 2015. The IPO was filed for $358 million. The company started trading under the name Fit. 2016, a massive year for Fitbit, a year of success, failure and change. Fitbit released two popular products. The Ulta and the Charge 2 had the mass appeal that led to Fitbit being able to sell 22 million units in 2016. Fitbit was also ranked number 37 out of the 50 most innovative companies for that year. On the 7th of December 2016, Fitbit acquired assets from Pebble after they decided to stop producing wearable technology. So with all the successes, acquisitions and the $2.17 billion revenue, why did Fitbit stock drop by 75%? Well, investors just weren't pleased with the running cost of the business. They might have made $2.17 billion, but the business costs were $1.2 billion. So how did Fitbit respond to this? They pointed out some of their main strategies going forward. They planned on making an entry into the smartwatch category, licensing productions and inventory of accessories, and continuing to scale the business globally. So it's 2017, the year of the Ionic. The Ionic was a brilliant smartwatch that did almost everything we wanted from it, but it just didn't have the connectivity or apps that users expected. James Park even noted in the TechCrunch interview, it didn't do as well as we wanted it to. 
that audience is much smaller than a mass appeal device. But speaking on whether the tracker was still important, he said, absolutely. When you launch into a category, you want to include a flagship device, which the Ionic is from a pure feature set. But now we're thinking about how to address the needs of a lot of other people. Fitbit as a company continued to stand out in the public eye that year. A man claimed that his wife was shot by an intruder but data pulled from the wife's Fitbit showed that the wife was at the gym at the supposed time of the shooting. Police were able to use the data to create a timeline of events. And that wasn't the only success for Fitbit in that year. They also released the Fitbit Flyer. I believe this is one of the best products on the market, it's one of the best wireless earphones that I've ever used but it was heavily under advertised in comparison to its competitors. The acquisitions continued for Fitbit in 2017. They acquired Romanian based smartwatch startup Vector Watch SRL for $15 million. Like Facebook, Fitbit realised that it's not enough to be ahead of the curve, you must also swallow the competition. So with 25 million users on its alternative social media feed, 60 million units sold by 2017, what was next for Fitbit? Well to correct this past mistakes, Fitbit's primary audience is women. In fact 72% of their users are female and only 27% are male. So it didn't make much sense for their flagship product, the Fitbit Ionic, to be aimed at men. James Park even said, the hope with the Fitbit Versa is that this is our true mainstream device from a feature set, design and price perspective. The Fitbit Versa could very well be the future for Fitbit, a product that has mass appeal but is primarily aimed at women, the contradiction that could solve the Fitbit puzzle. So what does the future hold for Fitbit? Well in 2018 they released the Fitbit Ace, which is aimed at children, and more recently they released the Fitbit Charge 3, and Fitbit stock has risen by 25% in 2018. When TechCrunch asked James Park if the company was out of the woods he said, it's too early to say that. I think what we're showing through the past year is that we've established and are looking to grow. As it stands Fitbit products are sold in over 39,000 retail stores and in 86 countries across the world. It has one of the world's largest social fitness networks and as Fitbit continues to grow there's no doubt that they will buy up more companies in a bid to lead innovation in the wearables market. Whatever the future holds for Fitbit, I hope they're here to stay. I'm Lionel, this is TechLoto and for more in-depth videos about your favourite tech companies, subscribe to TechLoto. Remember to leave a comment and let me know what you think about Fitbit and all of their products.